Hello everyone and welcome to the three-day free online course on Introduction to Space Law and Policy. Today we will discuss space law, its history and principal concepts. My name is Isidora Casas del Valle. I'm a Chilean associate in Brate Compañía and I'll have the pleasure to introduce you to the basic concepts of space law. In this course, we will learn about international space law. We will go over through a brief history of space law and we will analyze the most important international space treaties, as well as the current space issues that we have nowadays. So what is international law? The international law is a law that applies to states, regulating the relations between countries rather than people or its nationals. There are two basic sources of international law, treaties and custom. The rules contained in treaties are mandatory for the states that have agreed to be bound by them. And on the other hand, the practice of states generally accepted as part of the law that binds the state is known as customs. This is very relevant because even though the states have not signed or ratified an agreement or a treaty, the state has followed a certain practice for many years, and other states have agreed they are acceptable, due to which they become a law. So international custom may lead to the creation of legal rights and obligations for states, independently of any treaty regulation. So in this context, international space law regulates the legal problems arising from the exploration and particularly the uses of outer space. It is a body of law applicable to and governing space-related activities. So how did space law begin? It all began back in 1957 when the USSR launched Sputnik, the very first time a space object of one state orbited over the territory of other states. The interesting part of this is that there was no governmental protest or claim of invasion or sovereignty, leading to the creation of a customary international law in which space was treated as, was treated as a new territory not belonging to any state. Now, in the context of the Cold War, the US, the USSR, and in general, the world, was in need of definitions, rights, and obligations to bind states. Therefore, in 1958, the UN created the Committee for the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space in order to consider the activities and resources of the United Nations, the special ed agencies, and other international bodies relating to the peaceful uses of outer space, and also legal problems which might arise in programs to explore outer space. The creation of this committee is rather important since it originally consisted of 24 member states, but now it consists of 84 member states. It's one of the largest United Nations committees there is. So the idea of space law clearly arises from the necessity to regulate a new human activity, which takes place in outer space. The idea of humans conquering the next frontier is rather interesting. And as Constantine says, the earth is a cradle of humanity, but mankind cannot stay in the cradle forever. We have almost an intrinsic necessity to explore and go beyond. So in this context, we may find three different eras of space law. First, we have the classical period from 1957 to 1979 where major documents and structures of space law were conceived. It is in this point where space activities couldn't be done by the private entities, just by states and their governments. Nevertheless, by the end of the era, they decided the privates could participate in activities, but governments would take responsibility for the liabilities of those, pri those private actors in space. Also, commercial applications made space activities become more diverse. Satellites and communications have changed throughout time. And new domestic law and bilateral agreements were used to fill the gaps. 
Then in the second point, we have the transitional period from 1980 to 1991. More states became involved, which made it increasingly difficult for states to agree upon the rules. Before we had two basic superpowers, and now there's more actors who also have to voice their opinions and have their necessities. So it's increasingly difficult to agree upon certain rules. Also, commercial applications made space activities more diverse. And uh, again, domestic space law and bilateral agreements are continually to be used to fill the gaps. Now we ha are in the modern period, which started in 1992 to the present day. There's an increase in sophistications of technology and commercial use of space. There's more emphasis on the applications of space technology for economic development, sustainable development, and the new era that we're living today. We shall now review some of the treaties that are involved in space law and the principles behind them. So the Outer Space Treaty in, of 1967 is regarded as the Magna Carta of space law, providing the basic principles for the use of outer space. Here we will mention some of the relevant principles of the Outer Space Treaty you must keep in mind. First, the non-sovereignty. This principle implies that the exploration and use of outer space shall be carried out for the benefit and in the interest of all countries and shall be province of all mankind. The second principle we have is a non-appropriation, which states that outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies, are not subject to national appropriation by claim of sovereignty, by means of use or occupation, or by any other means. The principle of national appropriation was used during the New World Conquest back in the 16th and 17th century. This principle was agreed by the countries not to be applied in space, and therefore the national appropriation of outer space, the moon, and other celestial body is prohibited. And referring to what we said before, actually in 1963, following a resolution of the United Nations General Assembly, the known appropriation rule became a rule of customary international law, which now is part of the Outer Space Treaty and constitutes a fundamental difference between outer space and airspace. Now, as a third point, the non-weaponization principle expressly states that all state parties to the treaty undertake not to place in orbit around the Earth any objects carrying nuclear weapons of mass destruction, install such weapons on celestial bodies, or station such weapons in outer space in any other manner. The moon and other celestial bodies shall be used by all state parties to treaty exclusively for peaceful purposes. However, the military use of space for communications, navigations, reconnaissance and surveillance, it's a commonplace and it's an activity that takes place today. But you must keep in mind that everything that is used in, this, in space is exclusively for peaceful purposes. Now, regarding the freedom of outer space, where outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies, shall be free for exploration and used by all states without discrimination of any kind, on the basis of equality and in accordance with international law, and there shall be free access to all areas of celestial bodies. Therefore, this principle guarantees freedom of access, freedom of scientific investigations, all of which concerns all states, including developing countries, intergovernmental organizations, and private entities. Now, when we refer to space and space missions, the first thought that probably jumps into our minds are astronauts. To this regard, the Article 5 of the Outer Space Treaty declares that states shall regard astronauts as envoys of mankind in outer space who are basically messengers or representatives of human rights in space. Therefore, the state shall render them all possible assistance in the event of an accident, distress, or emergency landing on the territory of other states' parties or on the high seas. This provision was further expanded upon the Rescue Agreement of 1968, 
which we will discuss later on in this presentation. Then we have the state responsibility principle. This one makes states internationally responsible for the national activities in outer space. Whether the activities are carried out by governmental agencies or the private sector, states must ensure compliance of the activities with international treaty obligations. Hence, states are continuously authorizing and supervising space activities through national laws and regulation. Finally, we refer to the liability for damage caused by space objects, and this is one of the liability principles. Each state that launches or procures the launching of an object into outer space, from whose territory or facility an object is launched, is internationally liable for damage to another state party to the treaty or to its natural or juridical persons in airspace or in outer space. So, for instance, if a satellite collides with another satellite in space, the government must pay the remedies for the damage to the other government. This is extremely relevant considering the spike of space objects being launched to space and the amounts of space debris around them. The second treaty we are going to analyze today is the Moon Agreement. This one was adopted by the General Assembly in 1979, but it was not until July 1984 that it entered into force. This agreement reaffirms and elaborates on many of the provisions of the Outer Space Treaty as applied to the Moon and other celestial bodies, providing that those bodies should be used exclusively for peaceful purposes. In addition, the agreement provides that the moon and its natural resources are the common heritage of mankind and that an international regime should be established to govern the exploitation of such resources when such exploitation is about to become feasible. Now, basically this means that the moon and other celestial bodies are not to be subject to national appropriation by claim of sovereignty and that activities disrupting the lunar environments are prohibited. Therefore, the Moon Agreement, although it establishes a legal framework for national states concerning the recovery and use of space resources, it has only been ratified by 18 countries, including just 17 of the 95 member states of the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, which brings us to the uncertainty problem regarding the right to recover and use of space resources. Take a look at the table on your left. You will see the difference between the amount of states that ratified the Outer Space Treaty versus the Moon Treaty. While the Magna Carta was ratified by 109 nations, the Moon Treaty was only ratified by 18. As a visual exercise, and please consider that these images are not completely updated to today, you may find the distribution of the participation on the referred treaties. This is the Outer Space Treaty, where the party states are in green, the signatory are in yellow, and the non-participant states are in red. Now take a look at the Moon Treaty. The third treaty that we're going to analyze today is the Rescue Agreement of 1968, which obligates a state to take all possible steps to rescue astronauts and return them to their representatives of the launching authority. At the same time, the states are obliged to inform the launching authority and the Secretary General of the United Nations of any astronauts that are under its jurisdiction as a result of an accident or distress, emergency or an intended landing. In the same way, states are also obliged to inform if it discovers a space object has returned to Earth. Even more so, if requested by the launching authority, practical steps would, may, would be made by a country to recover and return a space object or its component or parts with the relevant expenses to be borne by the launching authority. The Liability Convention of 1972 is a more detailed version of the Outer Space Treaty. It imposes a liability for damages incurred by another state in the form of 
loss of life, personal injury, other impairments of health, loss or damage of property of states or persons, or property of international governmental organizations. Therefore, a state which launches or procures the launching of a space object, or a state from whose territory or facility a space object is launched, regardless if the launch was successful or not, is liable for the damages anyways. Now, depending on the scenario, the liability for cost damages will be different. If damage is caused by the space object on the surface of the Earth or to an aircraft in flight, the liability to compensate is absolute. But if damage is caused to another space object in space, the launching state is only liable if the damage is due to fault on the part of the launching state or its nationals. The Registration Convention of 1975 is the last treaty that we're going to look into. Countries that are parties to the Registration Convention are obliged to register all space objects for which they are launching the state and provide the Secretary General of the United Nations with information about every space object in their registry as soon as it's practicable. This information should include the name of the launching state, the designator or registration number, the date and location of the launch, and the general function and the basic orbital parameters of a space object. Now, after reviewing the previous treaties, we may conclude some of the current uh, space issues at hand. As we saw with the Moon Agreement, one starts to wonder if space treaties are the adequate form of legislation or not. Maybe multilateral agreements and national laws will be the future to regulate space matters. But how would this affect us? Additionally, the proliferation of satellites and source debris are both a technical and a legal challenge. Who is responsible for the collection and correct disposals of the space debris? How can we actually do it? Additionally as well, property rights in space and the status of the Moon Agreement is a debated discussion, especially when it comes to space mining and planetary resources. We have to answer the questions on how are we gonna regulate this activity? Finally, the ability to see Earth from space has promoted new world views of environmental awareness and the need for global, global unity. But to what extent is it really global unity and not a superpowers unity among the big players of the space sector? Is this how the future will look like? Many astronauts have this idea that we must protect Earth, our home. We must have environmental awareness. So should we maybe treat it as a spacecraft? Our lives depend on it. So. What we have reviewed is actually Earth law adopted here on Earth, but that regulates the activities we do in space. What happens when we colonize other planets? Will they have their own laws? Can we impose our Earth laws in the whole of the universe? So as food for thought, here's a story where a man said to the universe, sir, I exist. However, replied the universe, the fact has not created in me a sense of obligation. We hope you enjoyed the presentation and that you're more familiar with the basics of space law and its history.